I saw this illumination that was moving with respect to the stars. We were smart enough to not say, uh, Houston, there's a light out there that's following us. In the annals of human history, one giant leap for mankind was celebrated. Yet, concealed in the shadows of that historic moon landing lies a story never meant to see the light of day. But what revelation was so monumental that it was concealed from the world? And why? Did they witness the presence of extraterrestrial life or make contact with beings from beyond our solar system? Today we embark on a journey into the enigmatic depths of history, a journey that will unveil a shocking Apollo announcement that has remained hidden for far too long. A giant leap and a hidden truth. Over time, the inaugural moon landing has evolved into a pivotal element of American folklore. The archival audio, characterized by its characteristic crackles, emanating from the initially tentative but ultimately composed Neil Armstrong as he took his initial steps onto the lunar surface, while uttering the iconic phrase, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, remains exceedingly well preserved. This extraordinary achievement condensed a decade-long odyssey into a singular event, almost creating the illusion that, on a balmy summer day in 1969, three intrepid individuals ascended into a rocket, voyaged to the moon, donned their spacesuits, ambulated on the lunar terrain, and planted the American flag before their triumphant return. However, there exists an untold aspect of this historic mission. Neil Armstrong harbored a concealed encounter, one that remained veiled until his passing. In advance of Armstrong's historic lunar excursion on July 20, 1969, he, along with the rest of the Apollo 11 crew, underwent a rigorous and meticulous training regimen to prepare for their lunar mission. While a substantial portion of their training transpired within controlled testing facilities and classrooms, NASA also assigned the astronauts practical tasks such as the gathering of geological specimens. Furthermore, they engaged in intensive simulations of entering and exiting the lunar module, intending to ingrain these critical procedures into their muscle memory to facilitate their execution on the lunar surface. To heighten the authenticity of their training, the crew conducted training exercises at carefully selected terrestrial sites that closely resembled the moon's topography. Stephen Garber, a policy analyst within the NASA History Program Office elucidated the rationale behind this decision. Given the uncharted nature of the moon, NASA engaged in a degree of educated guesswork to identify locations that could approximate its geological characteristics. Inside the Apollo 11 landing drama, during their training, astronauts Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and Michael Collins embarked on numerous field expeditions, spanning diverse national and international locales. While the majority of their fieldwork unfolded in the American Southwest, encompassing regions within Texas, Arizona, and Nevada, this multiplicity of sites served to expose them to the various geological features they anticipated encountering during their lunar mission. As Garber notes, this comprehensive field training was meticulously structured to imprint the requisite procedures within the astronauts' muscle memory ensuring that they could perform tasks such as photography and soil and rock sample collection with proficiency and without hesitation. In addition to these practical exercises, astronauts partook in simulations involving trench excavation, the retrieval of samples at varying depths, site selection, and the insertion of core tubes into the lunar soil for sample collection. They also honed their ability to verbally and textually articulate geological features and adeptly documented their surroundings through photography. Crucially, they acquired the expertise to aptly label the samples they gathered. The efficacy of training at lunar analog sites became evident, prompting the National Aeronautics and Space Administration to incorporate analog missions as a routine training component for astronauts preparing for future space voyages, including subsequent Apollo missions. During the training process, it appeared that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin encountered an issue approximately four minutes into the landing sequence of Apollo 11. The situation unfolded when Apollo 11's commander, Neil Armstrong, communicated an abrupt message through Mission Control's speaker, stating, Program Alarm. 
Buzz Aldrin, positioned alongside Armstrong in the descending lunar module, observed a frozen display on the computer screen, which read 1202. This code was unfamiliar, and its origin remained unknown. In response, controllers in Houston diligently consulted their records to pinpoint the exact nature of the problem. However, time was of the essence. Armstrong, though sounding somewhat tense, remained consistent with his demeanor during previous simulations. Acknowledging the gravity of the situation was challenging. The life-or-death struggle was unfolding some 386,000 kilometers from Earth inside a delicate craft hurtling rapidly towards the moon. Communication signals were intermittent and the computer's stability appeared precarious. Gene Kranz, the flight director overseeing the first lunar landing, sensed mission control slipping further behind the operational curve. The issues commenced immediately upon the lunar module's separation from the command module, which had transported Armstrong, Aldrin, and Michael Collins to the moon. Collins stayed in the command module, while Armstrong and Aldrin descended. Yet Mission Control encountered difficulties with the radio link to the lunar module. The decision rested solely on Kranz's shoulders regarding how much information was sufficient to proceed. He pondered this, weighing the available information, and ultimately decided to give the crew the go-ahead for powered descent, the crucial phase of landing, 60 seconds to destiny. Aldrin had made efforts to resolve the issue, including repositioning the antenna. Mission Control also endeavored to rectify the problem on their end, but the radio connection remained plagued by intermittent disruptions. If the situation worsened, Kranz might have to order an immediate mission abort. Meanwhile, as flight controllers on Earth wrestled with communication problems and unreliable radar data, the lunar module's cabin alarm sounded, simultaneously triggering console warnings in mission control. The landing computer signaled an overload, specifically the 1,202 inches alarm. This indicated an excessive workload for the computer, necessitating a reboot and a fresh start. Under normal circumstances, such an event would warrant an immediate abort, as it jeopardized their ability to navigate the landing. Aldrin found the alarm surprising due to its unfamiliarity. However, their focus remained fixed on the lunar descent, leaving them no opportunity to consult reference materials. Neil Armstrong, initially tense, sought clarification from Houston. Back on Earth, controller Steve Bales made the critical decision that it was safe to continue as long as the alarm irregularities persisted. In the middle of the landing, attempting an abort with a malfunctioning computer was almost as perilous as proceeding with the landing. Charlie Duke, an astronaut and capsule communicator, relayed the decision to the crew in space. Armstrong and Aldrin continued the descent despite another alarm. 1201 of the same type. They were locked into monitoring critical data while Armstrong manually piloted the landing. Nevertheless, a new issue gradually emerged. They were not on the intended trajectory. Armstrong and Aldrin had overshot the predicted landing zone due to the moon's uneven gravity and additional speed gained during undocking from the command module. Consequently, what should have been a smooth level landing site according to the orbital map turned out to be a sprawling crater-filled area with boulder-sized obstacles. Armstrong took manual control, leveling off at an altitude of approximately 122 meters and searching for a suitable landing spot. This situation deviated significantly from their training and simulations, causing growing apprehension among the crew. They received no information regarding the nature of the problem. Only the peculiar trajectory they were following revealed that something was amiss. In the space capsule, Armstrong and Holdren found themselves flying for their lives. Their peril was twofold. Not only did they navigate an unconventional trajectory, but they were also grappling with a dangerously dwindling fuel supply. Approaching the critical 60-second mark, a point beyond which an abort was mandatory, uncertainty loomed. It was unclear if an emergency engine ignition at this altitude was even feasible. Controller Bales cautioned against entering what is colloquially referred to as the dead man's curve. This term denotes an altitude where there's insufficient time for an abort before an inevitable crash, a dire circumstance, as they were essentially on the brink of disaster. Duke relayed the 60-second fuel warning, but Armstrong remained resolute, focusing on a designated point for a smooth descent. Drink, meanwhile, diligently continued reporting speed and range data. The 60-second milestone was met with trepidation, signified by a low-level warning light in the control center, causing understandable concern. 
Aldrin recalled the normal expectation of having approximately two minutes of fuel remaining during a lunar landing. Remarkably, they were merely a hundred feet above the lunar surface, with only 60 seconds of fuel left. This was a pivotal juncture. Subsequently, a call for 30 seconds was issued, marking a critical phase in the mission. Breathing became laborious as they approached the lunar surface, raising the pivotal question, did they possess adequate fuel for a successful moon landing, or would they be compelled to abort perilously close to the lunar surface? When the world held its breath, Aldrin vividly recalled the moment when, at 30 seconds, they were a mere 10 feet or less from the lunar surface. He managed to sneak a glimpse outside, as Neil, presumably, cared little for numerical data at that juncture, and instead was fixated on the exterior view. Aldrin observed a shadow cast by the sun behind them. The descent engine, however, stirred up an unsettling amount of lunar dust at this altitude, obscuring visibility except for the faint outline of some boulders in the haze. Armstrong had only a lengthy metal rod extending from the landing legs to gauge their proximity to the lunar surface. Then, a significant moment arrived. The lunar landing legs made contact with the lunar plane, signaling a successful landing. A blue light on the console illuminated, signaling the conclusion of their descent. Armstrong calmly transmitted the iconic message, Houston, tranquility base here, the Eagle has landed. Surprisingly, Mission Control experienced a brief moment of silence before jubilation erupted among the onlookers. It took a physical gesture from Kranz to regain control and refocus the team after such an emotionally charged moment. He wrapped his arm on the console, inadvertently breaking his pencil, finally rallying his controllers to attention. However, the lunar adventure wasn't over. After successfully touching down, Armstrong and Aldrin faced a new challenge, a potentially dangerous pressure buildup in the lunar module's descent stage. This situation arose due to the extreme cold of the lunar surface infiltrating a fuel line, causing a blockage. The issue was promptly reported to Mission Control, sparking concern. This blockage could either lead to a relief disc blowing, relieving pressure but risking an explosion, or a catastrophic explosion itself. Kranz, Mission Control's leader, deliberated whether to alert the astronauts. A swift conference among Grumman representatives and flight controllers even contemplated aborting the moon exploration and initiating an immediate launch sequence. Fortunately, the engine's residual heat melted the ice, clearing the fuel line, and the situation was resolved. Pressures returned to normal, and controllers breathed a collective sigh of relief. Three hours later, as Armstrong and Aldrin prepared to step onto the lunar surface, a new issue emerged. They struggled to release all the air from the lunar module, preventing them from opening the hatch. Even after venting the oxygen to zero, the hatch remained stubbornly sealed. Aldrin eventually resorted to carefully peeling back a section of the hatch to avoid rupturing it, revealing a hint of humor in the face of this unexpected challenge. Armstrong skillfully navigated his way toward the open hatch, aided by Aldrin. As Armstrong shifted within his cumbersome suit to exit the lunar module, a small but crucial component suddenly snapped. Specifically, his backpack had damaged the ascent engine arming switch. At that moment, neither of them grasped the gravity of the situation. However, it was yet another perilous circumstance lurking in the journey. As recounted in Buzz Aldrin's book, Magnificent Desolation, The Long Journey Home from the Moon, Aldrin recalls an unusual discovery within the lunar module's cabin, an out-of-place circuit breaker switch. Perplexed, he examined the breaker panel closely, and the realization hit him hard. The broken switch belonged to the engine arm circuit breaker, a vital component required to provide electrical power to the ascent engine responsible for their return to Earth. Immediate action was imperative. The discovery was swiftly reported to Mission Control. Yet, a night of restless contemplation yielded no solution. As dawn approached, Aldrin decided to investigate further. His solution involved finding a suitable object within the lunar module to manipulate the circuit. Cautiously, he avoided any metallic objects and used a felt-tipped pen from his suit's pocket. In a calculated move, Aldrin advanced the countdown procedure by a few hours, accounting for the possibility that his makeshift solution might fail. With precision, he inserted the pen into the vacant slot where the circuit breaker switch should have been. Remarkably, it worked the circuit breaker engaged. Had it not, the consequences would have been dire, potentially stranding Armstrong and Aldrin on the moon. 
Even NASA's chief historian, William Barry, acknowledged the gravity of the situation. He stated that if the felt-tipped pen had failed, both Mission Control and the astronauts would have relentlessly explored alternative methods to close the circuit and ignite the ascent engine. This incident left such an indelible mark that subsequent lunar modules incorporated safeguards to protect these critical circuit breakers, a testament to the significance of Aldrin's quick thinking. Ultimately, the astronauts' improvised solutions secured their safe departure from the lunar surface. Buzz Aldrin still possesses the broken circuit breaker switch and the felt-tipped pen, tangible reminders of this dramatic moment in space history. Yet, perhaps even more intriguing than Aldrin's artifacts is the fact that Neil Armstrong kept a secret stash of space mission mementos for over four decades. Armstrong, who famously walked on the moon, retained a bag filled with various small items from the Eagle Lunar Module, which he and his Apollo 11 crewmate Aldrin piloted during their historic landing. Neil Armstrong's private lunar souvenirs, this McDivitt purse, named after the Apollo 9 astronaut who proposed its inclusion in the spacecraft, contained significant items like Armstrong's waist tether, utility lights, equipment netting, an emergency wrench, an optical sight, and the 16mm data acquisition camera that recorded the iconic lunar descent footage. These artifacts, including the camera, held immense historical value. Strangely, Armstrong never disclosed the existence of this bag of treasures, not even to his authorized biographer. Surprisingly, the bag was not clandestinely taken from the moon. It was moved from the Eagle to the Columbia Command Module before the lunar module was intentionally crashed back onto the lunar surface. Armstrong did mention the bag to Michael Collins, the Command Module pilot, during the transfer between spacecraft. While it was not uncommon for astronauts to retain small components as souvenirs, the secrecy surrounding Armstrong's collection remains a mystery. Despite the potential historical significance of these artifacts, it wasn't until after Armstrong's passing in 2012 that his widow discovered the bag, sparking great excitement among space historians and enthusiasts. The story of these hidden space mission artifacts raises intriguing questions about why Neil Armstrong chose to keep them concealed from the world, even from those closest to him. What motivated this extraordinary secrecy? While the Apollo 11 mission ended successfully, it leaves us pondering the mysteries of space and the enigmatic decisions of its pioneering explorers. The Exploration of the Far Side of the Moon The exploration of the far side of the moon presents several formidable challenges. The foremost obstacle is the absence of direct communication with Earth. Radio waves, which facilitate data transmission and command exchange between spacecraft and ground stations, cannot penetrate the moon's solid body. Consequently, any spacecraft or rover situated on the far side of the moon remains incommunicado with Earth for approximately 48 minutes during each orbit. To address this, any mission to this region necessitates the deployment of a relay satellite, introducing intricacy and cost to the operation. Furthermore, it mandates that any rover on the far side operate autonomously, devoid of human guidance or intervention. The second hindrance lies in the formidable terrain and harsh environmental conditions prevailing on the far side of the moon. Distinguished by its thicker crust, higher elevations, increased crater density, and reduced volcanic activity in contrast to the near side, it further lacks the maria, dark plains covered with solidified lava, which are prevalent on the lunar near side. While the causes of these disparities are not yet fully elucidated, they may be associated with the Moon's early history and inherent asymmetry. The far side of the Moon is also subjected to extreme temperature fluctuations, ranging from approximately minus 173 degrees Celsius during nighttime to about 127 degrees Celsius in daylight. These climatic conditions pose substantial challenges for spacecraft and rovers concerning landing, navigation, and operational sustainability. The third challenge pertains to the limited knowledge and data available concerning the far side of the Moon. Initially captured in a few grainy images transmitted by the Soviet Luna 3 probe in 1959, this region has only been subject to a handful of missions, such as NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, China's Chang'e 4, and India's Chandrayaan 2. In stark contrast, the near side of the Moon has undergone extensive mapping and sampling through numerous missions, including the six manned Apollo landings. Consequently, 
the far side of the moon remains predominantly uncharted and enigmatic. Notwithstanding these formidable challenges, scientists persist in their pursuit of understanding this remote lunar frontier due to the compelling benefits and incentives it offers. Firstly, the far side of the moon may hold vital clues regarding the moon's origin, evolution, internal structure, and composition. Notably, the South Pole Aitken Basin, a prominent feature on this side, is one of the oldest and deepest craters in the solar system, potentially exposing the lunar mantle, a region beneath the crust, which could contain valuable insights into the moon's formation. Secondly, evidence of water ice in perpetually shadowed regions near the lunar poles has been detected. These regions, characterized by extreme cold and darkness, may preserve water ice, potentially delivered by comets or asteroids over eons. This water ice is a valuable resource for future lunar exploration and potential colonization endeavors. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you are still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more quality content.